All right. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, perhaps good evening to uh, some of you. Um, my name is Jamie Tuff. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit about our subgroup and the guidance document we're putting together. Um, it was originally called the email subgroup, and through various conversations, uh, we have changed it to electronic communications. So next slide. So on this next slide, you can see the 11 uh, team members who made up the subgroup. I want to thank them all for their um, dedication, support, and obviously patience um, during this activity. Um, so thanks to this team that you see on the screen. A uh, special shout out to Mark Mercer and Russell Joyce as they were the two lead authors um, along with me to kind of pull everything together. Next slide. So I think, uh, uh, Jamie, before we go into this slide, I was going to launch the first poll, if that's ah, okay. All right, thank you. So the first poll, which I have now launched, is a more generic question about how big a problem email communications is to you and do you have an SOP? So we wanted to sort of get a view um, on where everybody is at the moment. So if everybody could vote, please. We've got 96 people on the call. So I'm really hoping that we're going to get lots and lots of, of um, people voting. You should, in reality, you should almost all be able, we should get to about 75 because most of you are just dialed in once. I noticed the names so so what is very fascinating about this is I thought it was going to be very much skewed one way and it's not which is very interesting especially the first question so what I'm going to do I'm just going to get we we've, we've We've got about 70 people, 70% 70 of people that have voted. So thank you everybody for voting. It's really appreciated. Right, I'm gonna stop there because that's 68, 70% of people that have voted. So let's go with that. So, Jamie. There we go. Okay. Here's the results. What do you think? So interesting. Um... <laughs> Not a problem, we got this, I love that. 8%, uh, somewhat of a problem, 20. So it looks like between somewhat and it's a problem is the majority. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, it's, a, it's exactly what we had anticipated, mm -hmm. I think, and you know, we've been talking about the problems of email and how, to, uh, how you manage it uh, for some time now. So um, interesting that um, many, um, the 60-40 split for the company having relevant correspondence definition. I think we find that um, the, there is a definition, but it may be difficult to, um, to follow, or um, there might be that um, uh, process of trying to um, file it, or if you have CROs that you're engaged with, trying to also have them follow relevant correspondence definition um, but the problem is, is, and even in this COVID-19 world, I think the email has probably quadrupled. I know it has in my case because we're, we're not seeing people face to face. So we're doing a lot more via email uh, and electronic communications. Absolutely. Interesting. I think it's interesting to see. Oh, sorry, Russell, go for it. Sorry, it's quite interesting to see that 60% of people actually have a relevant correspondence definition, but for 92% of people, it's still a problem. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect there. Mm. Yeah, I, I think guess it, you could correlate it to, you know, it just keeps multiplying. I know um, I went out on vacation for a week and I had over 1,400 emails and many of them were not relevant, but I had to make a decision what's relevant out of these 1400 in five days time. So, um, you know, the, the problem gets compounded over uh, the longer you don't deal with the email. Um, so that's why the, in the guidance document, we do talk about 
take care of it as it comes in. Don't wait. <laughs> Don't wait. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I had a, an interesting comment, although I seem to have lost my comments now. One second. Where did my comments go? But we did have an interesting comment. If I could just come back to it. I seem to have lost it. Um, that basically, um, uh, they, somebody's got an, ele uh, an electronic communications SOP, but they've been waiting for this before they actually go and, um, and issue it and make it formal. So it will be out and it will be launched. So let's stop sharing the results. And Jamie, back to you to do the slides. Hopefully you can see the slides. Yes. Um, okay, so, so yeah, just to, to give you a high level of the objectives of our group, we actually kicked off in October 2019 um, the group then split into four uh, chapter sub teams and then we came back together and, and brought the document back together um, and then myself Russell Joyce and Mark Mercer we um, worked on you know the consolidation if you will and kind of bringing a do the document together as you can imagine from four just different sub teams um, the objectives were um, to uh, look at the issues associated with the electronic mail so um and to also include definition around management of relevant communications uh ensuring retention and uh also that it's managed in an authoritative system um and to produce that during a health authority inspection um we did say in scope were our positions and guidance and some recommendation uh, for how to manage this. Um, obviously, uh, our group was comprised of various viewpoints, sponsor, CRO, vendor, as well as consultant. And out of scope was a technology tool for automation or specific technology tools for managing electronic communications and email. So next slide, Karen, or I don't know if we want to share another. Yep. Right. No, we'll do the poll after this slide, I think. All right, awesome. So uh, this is a high level of the overview, uh, overview of the guidance document. Um, it is 21 pages uh, and we include things like how to effectively file email, um, who might be responsible for filing, subject lines, just some um, uh, great uh, tidbits on <laughs> subject lines. Don't, be a, don't add to the subject line um, chaos by changing subject lines. Uh, we talk about email branching or threads, attachments, embedded links, um, blinding emails and what those might contain as well as dates for emails. And then uh, we do go into archiving, right? So because um, these are considered records, uh, we do talk about archiving, which obviously is the uh, one of the last states of a record before destruction. So we go into archiving. Uh, we list out also the 17 citations uh, that were found uh, in regulations around um, email and communications. And then we have appendices on uh, preservation formats, uh, repository options, as well as definitions. So I think we have a poll coming up. So it is comprehensive, but again, it's guidance. We are not saying you have to do this. And if you don't do this, you know, this will happen. This is guidance. So you can um, read it and adapt some of it. You can just read it and not adapt any of it. <laughs> so again, it's best practices and guidance that were found across multiple folks uh, across the industry. All right, so, so what we've done is put together some of the polls and the polls are very much around the sort of the topic. So if you guys could go in um, and on the basis that we had, we've now got more people on the call and we had 68 people answer last time. So please do go in and answer the questions. How do you manage the communications? Um, how do you file them? Who's responsible for filing them? How do you handle email attachments? Are emails reviewed as part of periodic quality review? And how do you archive? I'm hoping you can all see it because at the moment it's saying nobody's voted. Aha, that's okay. It says two people, but I'm assuming, oh, I know what it's doing. It's waiting till you've answered all the questions before yeah. it then says you voted. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, 
So can everybody, Michelle, you say you can't see the poll questions. Um, can anybody give Michelle any advice on how to see them? Because I can't, I, what I see is different to what you see. Do you have to click on something to see them? Oh, you need to click on polls. So on the right hand side, uh, there's a little, a, a little bar chart. I think there's a little bar chart called polls. And if you click on them, then they come up. I click on the radio button, but so I think, um, Angela, you need to answer all the questions. Right. If you answered every single one of the questions, then you should be able to get to the bottom. It doesn't look like it's clicking, but it is in each question. And then if you hit submit at the then submit yeah. is illuminated. Yeah. Oh, so Kelly's saying if you're accessing um, Zoom from a browser, polling doesn't function properly. Oh. Well, we've got 40 people so far and it's still coming in. So I'm afraid. Yeah, sorry, Michelle. I think it looks like We'll, we'll get as many as we can. Hopefully, yeah. we'll get, hopefully we'll get to about 50 people. I've got 47 so far, so we should be getting there. Um, just as a couple of comments, um, I had a, uh, so someone said they had to switch from the browser to the app to see the polls. Um, but somebody also asked, Antoinette, was the presentation available after the meeting? Yes, it is. And actually, that's a very good point. Once the polls are all, up and I publish them. Can someone please capture me a screenshot? I should have done that first time around, but this is- Yeah, more, this I'm is doing more. that, Karen. I oh, thank it. you, thank you. Because yeah, the well, problem is well. from this end, all I can see is, I, I can't see it properly. Okay, if you could do that, would be brilliant. And then um, Antoinette, with the, if you go to www.tmfrefmodel.com, the slides will be up with all the answers as well. And the email um, uh, document, the email guidance, do sorry, apologies, the electronic yeah. communications guidance document will be available there as well. Okay, so I think we've got, that's pretty good. We've got over 60 people that have voted. So let me end the polling and share the results. So Jamie, you can see the results now. Yep. Okay, so how do you manage electronic communications today? Um, so it looks like file separately into the artifact location within the ETMF on an ongoing basis, 70%. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that is not what I would have anticipated. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, have said, I added in print and file as paper because I wanted to see if there were still people that were printing and filing as paper because I that's, you know, that, that still happens. And so... Only two people, but it's still 3% of the overall. Yeah, um, so I think that's great. Filing of emails. Um, so it might, uh, Jamie, just to confirm in, in, in our guidance document, we've actually, we state that we are prefer, our recommended approach is to file them on an ongoing basis. Exactly, yes. so everyone's basically complying, aren't they? Yes, exactly. And I, I'm trying to capture these because they go off the screen. Uh, Karen just saying that, you know. Um, so let me scroll down. So uh, it looks like for filing, do you, yep, file as you go. That's awesome. Um, glad to not see the file at the end of the trial anymore because I know that was always um, a practice that we were seeing. Um, who is responsible? Originator of the communication. Awesome. We do have a whole uh, section around, um, you know, identifying who's going to file. Um, I love that uh, a few people, 12% said that, said, who knows? Um, but nobody uh, is filing duplicates. So that's good. Well, uh, uh, proactively, I, I would have thought. <laughs> but I, I added in the who knows, because I just thought, I bet there's a lot of people who actually just say, I don't know what people are doing. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me go this. Okay. okay, so how do you handle email attachments? Uh, looks like always filed with the email. So that's interesting. So we do have a whole section on um, the attachments because there are some things to consider 
around the actual attachment and if it gets filed with the email or if it gets filed into the artifact zone um, separately. You could have an email that has um, an attachment, but the email is just kind of like the envelope to get it to the recipient, but the pertinent or relevant um, communication is the actual attachment. So we do have a section that covers that. Are emails reviewed as part of the periodic quality review? Um, yes, always. Who knows what may be hiding there? <laughs> I love the responses, Karen. So I'm glad that um, uh, we had some <laughs> responses because it's true. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and yeah, so that's great to hear as well because we do cover that in the guidance document. And then how do you archive your emails? Uh, they're in PDF in the ETMF. The native files are deleted. So that's interesting. Um, so that's 45% and the other percentage, we never ever delete any native and we keep native format for retention period then delete. So Russell, do you wanna comment on that number six? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not surprised by the um, principal form of archiving being PDF because I think most people, if they're using an ETMF, save their emails into the ETMF in PDF format anyway. Um, I'd be interested to know what the retention period is for keeping native formats uh, before deleting um, uh, and what the difference might be between that and keeping them in PDF. Um, I, I think the suggestion of never ever deleting any native format emails is perhaps storing up uh, problems for the future because those emails may not have context uh, around the uh, artifacts to which they relate and it may be problematic trying to uh, marry uh, any emails up with any particular causes of action that uh, potentially may be recorded in the TMF itself. So uh, no, no real surprises there, uh, just an interest really to know um, what the difference would be between the retention of uh, a native email and a PDF email and what the rationale and is for it. Russell, there's a question that's coming. Can you explain what you mean by native? So um, that would be the format in which your email client uh, creates the email in the first place. So if you are using Microsoft Outlook, generally that would be a .msg message. If uh, anyone out there is still using Lotus Notes, that would be a .nsf file. Um, so th that's what we mean by that. It's simply the format in which the email client will originally create the email communication. Um, and, and Noreen has said that w what they do is they keep their emails in the ETMF. Um, assuming they, and I'm assuming Noreen, what you mean by that is they actually go into the ETMF in native format and then they get converted to maybe a PDF from a viewing perspective, uh, but you keep them in the ETMF in the native format in which they're uploaded. Um, yeah, and that's part of yeah, the beauty of a native common. format email, of course, is that um, the, it has a 100% integrity because you can prove that it was an email. You can even actually prove the uh, journey that the email went on from, mm -hmm. from one computer to another. Um, so from an integrity perspective, that's the very best way to keep it. There is potentially um, some loss of integrity if you're uh, reformatting to PDF, but um, it depends on very much on the way in which you do that. But from so a regulatory perspective, that's not going to be an issue for you, only from a legal one, and I think that's a very low risk. Thank you, Russ. So it's a question that's coming. I'm going to try and keep a track on all the questions, but there's a question that's come in about dating conventions and what dating conventions do you recommend for saving emails? And it's interesting some of these questions are coming up because as a steering committee, we've been through this document and a lot of the questions that are coming up are the ones that we've been debating. So yes. um, Jamie, do you want to sort of handle the, the thoughts around dating conventions for saving emails? And, and the question is, is it the original email date or the last date the email was responded to? Um, so we actually say that, um, and this was a hot topic with the steering committee, right? So the document date assigned to an email matches the date of the email uh, where a thread is saved, the last email in the thread. Um, 
So we do have um, different date formats. Um, you know, so for example, you might save a, an email communication outside of a commercially available ETMF. Uh, so to save those emails in chronological order if you are doing that. Um, and to also organize those in a chronological order. If you're using an ETMF, uh, then you may not be able to do that, but you may be able to have the dates um, and you could do searches or run reports perhaps, depending on your ETMF system, uh, and assign the dates as metadata um, to permit the sorting of those uh, via metadata fields. Um, so we do say, you know, the meaningful date for the, for the email should match the date of the email. And if there's a thread, it should be the last email in the thread would be the date that is used. And I think, Jamie, one of the things this highlights is the fact that it's, it's not a, an absolute. So what one company will do, another company does something somewhat slightly differently. But the most important thing is to have a SOP, work instruction, whatever you want to call it, that says this is how you do it. So if someone comes in and inspects you, um, you're following the the what you say you should be doing and equally for people working in this on in in the etmf they need to understand how things are filed but interesting their questions are coming up um yes. i'm just seeing if there's anything else that is specific there's lots about zoom polls etc etc um so we have a question um around um with companies switching to using teams actually this is a really interesting one how is this impacting electronic communication filings? And I'd, I'd like to, obviously to you, Jamie and, and Russell, but actually to anybody that's using Teams, what are you doing with your, um, your electronic communications through Teams? So Jamie, what, what's your thoughts? Sure, so for MS Teams, our company before they rolled it out and they did roll it out um, right as the pandemic, pandemic uh, hit, um, there was guidance on usage of teams um, to not put um, key decisions, things like that into the IMs, chats, and that, you know, authoritative sources still had to be used for the filing of such uh, decisions and key actions. So um, MS Teams is, is used to help uh, teams, obviously, but we do still maintain our authoritative sources for content that has to be reviewed um, and open for inspection. Is there anybody else who wants to comment on Teams, the use of Teams, challenges? I think Jamie's anybody... right in saying that you shouldn't be putting out um, uh, messages on teams that are going to be critical in terms of re, you know, retaining the evidence of courses of action or decisions being made. Um, if you don't actually have a retention policy applied to teams, the message is actually uh, deleted um, permanently from teams. Um, and once it's deleted, it's gone forever. So um, th that is uh, a tricky thing to manage. If uh, uh, So I, I would recommend Jamie's um, the strategy of not putting on teams anything that's critical and needs to be retained. Just when we talk that. about teams, I'm sorry, when we talk about teams, are we specifically talking about the chat feature or anything more dynamic to do with teams? Like, a anything more dynamic? A any of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Any or all of it. Actually, um, Rob Jones has put a comment in saying that where he was previously, they said non-critical tasks only, but actually he said the company went as far as to disable the logs of chats. So people then, I'm assuming, couldn't mm -hmm. say, oh, well, it's in a chat, I'll just, I'll just store that. Yeah. So yeah. it seems as though it's quite, quite routine that that's what people are doing. Because obviously, if you start having in a chat, then people will say, well, let's copy the chat. But then you've lost right. all, as you say, Russell, you've lost all the integrity of that because it's just literally mm -hmm. a, a, almost like a Word document that you've just typed out. Yeah, I think there's, an, I, th I think there's an option in Teams to um, uh, use the three dot menu in the right hand side of the chat message and you can share to Outlook, um, share a conversation over email. 
So that there's that option as well, but I think the safest thing is not to have any critical information uh, in yeah. your chat into it at all. Uh, yeah. Just use it for very casual conversations. Um, another question, thank you very much guys. Another question that came in is, for documents stored electronically in the TMF, are there requirements for certifying the copies? How do other companies manage this process? Also, are we required to maintain the original paper document if our system is not considered Part 11 compliant? That's quite a long question and you can't see it, unfortunately. So, <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, that goes beyond uh, email or electronic communication. Yeah. That's for any kind of certification of a... Yeah, yeah so... Um, um, remind me, um, Jamie, did we ever do anything on certified copy in the end? I know, or anybody on the steering committee, I know we were going to put something out, um, but I don't remember whether we did. What we do have is the... The notes from the framework presented. Yeah. Oh, we, we've got the, frame, the DIA copies. framework, yes. Karen. Yeah. That's yep. true. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank I, you I very would much. refer people to the I would refer people to the DIA framework, and within yeah. that there is a flowchart um, for defining uh, whether or not you need to have a certified copy. I think the important yep. thing to remember there is that you only need a certified copy if you're seeking to replace the original. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and not simply just to have it as a convenience or working copy uh, where yes. you always have reference to the original um, for, for yeah. integrity purposes. No, absolutely. And, and thank you, Russell. I complete. I knew that we didn't do it as part of the steering committee. I knew it, it wasn't a TMF, right? It was bigger. It was the EDM group. And Lisa, you're, uh, you're on. I wonder whether you could direct um, Christina as to whether, where where to go to get the framework do we have it on our website we probably should i'm going to oh, post the link do. okay mm. thank you thank you russell yeah. cool excellent okay so i'm just all looking right. through all my questions to see if there's anything else relating to we did all the polls correct karen we've done all the polls absolutely um oh and just one comment if the system's not 21 cfr compliant then you need to retain the paper um, but absolutely, go and have a look at the framework. I knew it was somewhere. Um, <laughs> right, I'm going to stop sharing the results. And Jamie, I'm going to hand back to you because I think you have yep. one slide. Yeah, so um, we are finalizing a few last tweaks from the steering committee. Um, so I have my last meeting with uh, Russell and Mark tomorrow for the final comments. And we're looking to publish out on tmfreferencemodel.com on Friday, July 31st. And that will be the version 1.0 with that date. So I will um, email Eldon Rommel in a little bit to talk to him about the publication of that out on tmfreferencemodel.com. That is fantastic. And I have to mention that means hopefully we will have the uh, electronic communication guidance. So thank you very much and also the real world studies out by uh, Friday. Just one quick uh, comment. There was a question, Harsha, you wanted to know an update about the um, NIS specific model. Um, so the person to contact would be Russell Joyce and Russell maybe, um, if you could post your email address in the chat, if you wouldn't mind Russell, and then Harsha get in touch with Russell. That will be fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to actually just, um, I'm going to ask Todd and Mary Christine just to do a very, very quick update yep. on um, the MHRA FDA joint paper on data integrity. So over to whichever one of you is talking. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. This is Todd. So if anybody out there doesn't subscribe to the MHRA Inspectorate blog, uh, it's recommended. They, they often have some interesting articles and links to interesting information, announcements, uh, to give you perspective on the UK's regulatory agency, which, as most of us know, has been kind of a thought leader in the TMF area for a long time. So uh, definitely check out that blog if you haven't. And recently on that blog, they announced a, a paper that had been written uh, jointly by the MHRA and FDA based on a meeting they had, a good clinical practice workshop they had, a couple of years ago. Uh, and 
some of us were able to get the get the article for free. <laughs> Others couldn't find a way. If you get hit a paywall, uh, if you live in the U.S. because this was written by FDA, you can just contact the author to get a copy for free because it's a government work. So, um, just a little tip if you, if you hit a paywall. <laughs> so, what is this? What is this paper all about? Uh, you can go hang to the on, next slide. Hang on, uh, hang on. There you go. <laughs> all right. So you uh, want Marie Christine? Do you want do you want to take it? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, okay. so this is an interesting, interesting paper, right? I mean, and um, actually, it's really focusing on clinical trial data and um, all aspects of data management, data lifecycle, uh, etc. So, so clearly, um, there's, you know. Um, some of some of the what they it's described in this particular article may not always be that much relevant for TMF. However, there might be some you know um, very specific aspects of uh, some of what is described in this paper that apply to actually the TMF domain, and especially when they actually talk about consideration for restricted and blinding data. Right. How do we handle that, manage that in the TMF domain? How do you have your security or, you know, controls in place in your system to make sure that if you get in your system documents that may contain unblinding information, that actually you have the right controls in place and security to avoid, you know, unblinding of, of the study because people would have access to that information. So there might be multiple different ways of doing that in your respective organization. So um, that's one aspect of that is I think of interest in, in that paper. But overall, what I would say is that in this article, although it's really very much focusing on data integrity in the context of data management, I think that you, there's a lot that can apply to the TMF domain in terms of the document lifecycle, all the different controls, the end-to-end -end process, uh, getting, you know, uh, not only how you manage the documents that are kind of coming, coming in, but also all the way through your archival of your, your content and the retention. So all in all, I think that um, it's an interesting read um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of similarities um, with, with TMF and what we do in, in, in the TMF domain. And uh, I think that the big, biggest takeaway here is the importance of having a clear governance, not only for unblinding data, but for everything that we do in, um, in TMF management. So, uh, there's, um, I think that when you read the end of the article, it, it, you have really your, your recipe for success, if I can say, right? You have, it tells you about having a process, having controls, operating in a validated um, system, having audit trails, and making sure that you, you understand what they are for and how you use them and that you can actually show how you use them, having oversight, risk managing really all activities in TMF. So all what it's done in the data management area can actually certainly be applied, applied as well as in, in TMF. And, um, and so another takeaway message from the article is the fact that I think that we are seeing more and more collaboration um, of you know regulators, so this joint article is a perfect example, right? I mean, you have here you have the FDA and the MHRA, um, I mean, publishing and releasing a joint paper, uh, and clearly in that paper they also mention about having more and more collaborations in terms of sharing best practices across um, regulators and um, and participating together to inspections, which, which has happened and will happen, um, I'm sure, uh, more and more. And, and it seems that um, what we may expect as well is because there are this willingness really to have more aligned, consistent, global, international 
uh, best practices that uh, regulators will also influence the revision of, of ICH um, E6. So, so definitely regulators are really collaborating. They are consulting each other. They are aligning their guidance uh, that are related to common GCP issues. And they are really definitely very much focusing and looking at novel innovative trial design so with everything that has happened with the pandemic and um, all the new um, the accelerated you know thinking and implementation of um, new study designs as well as new technologies it's really going to change the landscape of, of of what we are doing so that may actually also have an impact on the tmf and the traditional TMF the way we know it. So interesting read if you have the time, it's 18 pages. Um, there's uh, good information um, in, in that paper. I don't know if we have questions, Karen. Um, hold on one second. I was gonna say, Todd, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think Mary Christine summed it up. Uh, there's also, as you know, there's some, there's some nice life cycle diagrams there about, yes. about the life cycle of data. I thought those are pretty, pretty good uh, diagrams, but it's definitely a dense paper, 18 pages. Got to be ready to get into that. <laughs> yes, maybe with a nice glass of wine or something. <laughs> but again, I mean, I think that if you get into it, I mean, um, it, 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 it translates well in our, in our domain. I mean, in, in what we do in, in the TMF space, actually. If you, if you approach that article that way, I know, I must admit, I thought it was quite nicely written. It was quite, an, I say, an easy read. It wasn't, it wasn't one of those ones where you get lost halfway through. Exactly, it's actually quite exactly. It. That's very true. That's very true. Once you get into it, you say, hmm, that's, I want to read more. <laughs> yeah, I know, absolutely. Um, there, there has been a request for the link to find the paper. Todd, since you know where you got it, can you, could you... Yeah, Put so the, the, the link chat. is actually on the prior slide. So the prior slide, uh, oh, the, there is okay. a link yes, right is. there. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe when we publish the slides, we'll just actually put the whole link. I mean, it's a clickable link. Um, so we'll put the whole link there so people can see it in case it doesn't work. But you go there, and then it gives you a link to where some people were able to get download the paper, others weren't. And if you were unable, that's the workaround of emailing the author directly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll make sure that that link is the link, not just the, the, the words MHRA. And it'll be on the slides then, no problem at all. Excellent, thank you very much, most appreciated. Okay, so, oh, a uh, couple of, one quick thing on um, events coming up. Um, and most of them are virtual. There's the Clinical Document World, 8th to the 11th of September. I think that's the right date still. Um, then there's the ETMF Summit, which is still down to happen in October. Still haven't got confirmation if it's in person or if it's virtual. I'm guessing it's going to be both. There's the ETMF Forum um, in New Jersey and virtual. Um, again, nothing is confirmed as to definitely being face-to-face. -face. Um, the, um, uh, the GXP San Antonio and the IQPC is now next year. Okay, doc. So the last in the last ten minutes, and I thought we were going to—I I was thought we were going to run out of uh, things to talk about, but we'll never do that when it comes to TMF. A few questions. So I'm going to just pose them, and anybody who wants to answer them, feel free to answer them. Um, so the and I know for a fact that, that I, I can I can answer some of these from what people have told me. But one of the questions that came in was around um, the audit starting up and most of them being remote. Um, and has anybody heard about whether site audits may be remote also? Um, and I must admit, I thought I had heard that they were, that they, that they were looking at doing remote site audits. Anyone had any experience of remote site audits yet? Oh, okay. So Rochelle is saying they've had one remote one. So Rochelle, was that um, at, actually at the investigator site then? And you're more than welcome to unmute yourself if you want to, but you're also more than welcome to just keep chatting on the, um, on, on the, the screen as well. Anybody else had any? But it sounds to me, um, yeah, it was a PI site, absolutely. So it sounds to me, um, Jane, that, that um, 
they are people are having are starting to have remote site audits um right the next question i've got and suzanne you made me laugh how to keep people from filing absolutely everything in the tmf for fear of missing an item now i have to say um i think it, for me it's about teaching people to think about what is relevant but i also know there's a fear factor that um if you don't that if you don't put in the tmf then there's going to be a problem um, has anybody actually tackled this problem head on and got a solution for it? Well, not really, actually. That's, <laughs> um, I mean, so you, we, when it, oh, sorry, carry on. Yeah. So what, what, what we've done, for example, especially for correspondence, because I think this is where sometimes, I mean, we can, you can have everything and anything. So, I mean, glad we're going to have this, this new guidance here. But um, we have a very defined, detailed guidance in, you know, on what to consider relevant correspondence, etc. And we, part of the review of the TMF content, we get to the level of the correspondence as well. So, I mean, it's it's about I think, you know, the level of controls that you put in your process, in your system, in your TMF control in your TMF requirements that may help avoiding having, um, you know, or people using the, the TMF as, you know, this big repository where you can put everything just because you're afraid that um, it's not going to be in there. So it's about controls, controls of the content of yeah. the documents that are getting in, in, in your system. And I think it's also about people not being scared to not put something in, uh, you know, it needs to be yes. a, a, it makes sense as such. Yeah. Um, right, I'm just going to try and fly through the rest of the questions because I'd hate to not answer them. Um, so there was a very specific question, Jemri, from 114 is trial team evidence of training documentation. Normally trial team would mean sponsor. 553 is site evidence of training. 1117 is vendor management plan. 9113 is ongoing party oversight. There is no specific section listed for filing vendor or third party training documentation. Where is it? So basically, the question is where are people putting the training documents for your CROs? Um, I must admit, I've seen people putting it in the trial team evidence of training just because they are effectively the trial team. Um, does anybody, are people putting it in zone nine or are they putting it in zone one? So this is your CRAs, uh, do EDC yes. training for your study. So Karen, this is, this is Mary Christine. So we do like you, you just described in the, in zone one. So it's part of the, um, the study team. They're part of the study team, whether they're at your company or at the CRO. So that's where, where it's fine. Mm-hmm. If anybody else got any other thoughts on any, any, hang on a second, I need to scroll down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So, oh, there you are. There you've got your answer. Zone one, zone one, zone one, zone one. Either trial evidence of training or the CRO maintains it. Zone one. Uh, yep. Yeah, I'd yeah. say zone one, but zone, zone one. nine for one off vendors. Thank you, Fran. But everybody else is basically saying zone one. There you are. That's a good way to get an answer. Um, okay, so where have I got to? One second, sorry, I'm just going backwards and forwards very quickly. Um, I'm just going through the questions in no lot, just in the in in chronological order. Um, uh, Dixon, there was a question about will the release of the um, uh, real world studies reference model change the existing artifacts in the reference model, or will it only be add on artifacts? So basically, it is an index of the real world study artifacts. Some of them have some changes um, and some of them are used as they are. My suggestion is that you, you have a look on Friday or whenever it's released, it'll be in the next week or so. Um, and then if you've got questions to go back to Russell and Russell's email address is in the chat somewhere. So if you wouldn't mind doing that. Um, there's a question from Manila. Um, welcome Manila. Um, 1033 edu edit check programming for documents we filed in the section expectation to identify the only oh that's a very 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 specific question can i suggest manila that 
and on the in, in the fact that I've only got a few minutes left, can you post that to the TMF reference model.com website? Now, this is actually something I do want to put the slide up on. Um, next meeting is 21st of September, but this is where you go. So HTTP TMF reference model.com. You can register there. And once you've registered there, then you can go and you can post your question. So Manila, that's a very specific question. I suggest you go and post it there um, because I think they, people will have a chance to, to answer it. So anybody else who asked the question, and I know somebody's also emailed me, um, uh, that's where you go to, to get the chats um, and get all the information. Um, so I'm going to skip all the way down to see what the questions were at the bottom. Um, 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 um. Quick question, central and local testing, only for blood, labs, blood urine, or would you consider spirometry, ECG and other vendors? Um, I have to say that the reason we changed it to central and local testing, it doesn't say labs, is it, it, it was designed for any type of centralized testing or local testing. So absolutely, any, any images, anything that you, are, that you are doing testing for the study. I know some people have put things into third party, but the, the way it was designed originally was definitely that any type of testing would go into central and local testing and you would differentiate using metadata to say whether it was the lab or whatever it might have been. Um, 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 um. Um, yes, Karen, the, the call is recorded, so you'll be able to go and pick up on the call. And Sarah, thank you. So Sarah, Sarah uh, was talking in response to something else, which was about what, how do you get people to file what needs to go in? And she's saying, to try and make a comprehensive list of all the documents that should be included. Um, although obviously, there, often there are documents that appear that you didn't know about. Um, and I think with a minute to go, I've managed to get through all the questions. Well, that was quite fun. Um, thank you everybody for participating and throwing your questions, etc., etc. Really, really good. Um, and we will, the recording will be available as well as, um, the slides will be available and don't forget the next meetings on the 21st of September. And again, we'll probably try and do a bit of Q and A again, because I think it's quite nice if people have questions. So dead on five o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody. Much appreciated it. Um, stay well, stay safe, look after yourselves um, and have too much fun. Great rest of summer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> summer, it's raining here. It's not summer. Oh, no. Anyway, my, my, my oh. power survived, which was fantastic. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.